<laughs> it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. The Financial Accountability Office's latest report paints a very dark picture for Ontario's municipalities. Despite swimming in $6.4 billion, this government is shortchanging our cities and towns. They're withholding $120 million for services and a further $644 million earmarked for repairs to infrastructure, to broadband, and other supports that people out there desperately need. Can the Premier explain to Ontarians why he doesn't deem their communities worthy of the investments his government promised? To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the member opposite for that question. You know, I've got the fall economic statement here. I've got the budget from uh, last April that we took to the people. And, you know, as I go around and the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing goes around and the Premier and the Deputy Premier, uh, we talk to big city mayors, we talk to rural mayors, we talk to all kinds of mayors. And you know what they keep telling us? Thank you for the investments that we're making in their communities. What do I hear? You know, maybe we should get out and listen a little bit. You know what I hear? Thank you to the Minister of Infrastructure for investments in broadband, which is so critical to many of our communities. You know what else I hear? We hear? Thank you for the investments in the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund so they can upgrade their water Response. and their sewage, which we doubled to $2 billion. And you know, just recently at the uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario, they said thank you for the state. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Let me, let me tell the minister uh, what's really happening out there. This government is hitting municipalities on all sides. First, they let their rich developer friends skip the bill and starve municipalities out of billions, and then they sit on nearly a billion dollars earmarked for municipal services and infrastructure. Now, people from Oshawa to Thunder Bay are facing massive increases in their property taxes as municipalities are scrambling to make up for that lost funding. And in Waterloo region alone, taxes are going up 8.55% at a time when people are already hurting. Go out there and talk to homeowners. Their heating bills are up. Their grocery bills are through the roof. Can this Premier explain why he's making Question. everyday Ontarians pay his developer friends' bills? Minister of Finance. Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what kind of math they're teaching in Waterloo, but that just isn't the, the truth in terms of actually understanding. Okay. I'm going to ask the minister to withdraw. First time in five years I do that. Uh, <laughs> you know what? When we go to places like the Waterloo region, you know what they say? They say thank, thank you thank for you. the investments in infrastructure right across this whole province, here, Mr. Here. Speaker. They say thank you for helping us with highways, building highways, not just in the 413, the Bradford Bypass, but, Mr. Speaker, the Highway 7 between Qu Kitchener and Guelph. That's what they're talking about. Exactly. They're talking about the widening of the Highway 17 all the way from Empire to Renfrew. They're talking about the Timmins connecting link. The Timmins connecting link. They're talking about moving people and goods so that the hardworking people in this province can take their kids to school, that they can take their goods to market. That's what we're doing in this province, Mr. Speaker. The final supplementary. You know what they're teaching in Waterloo, Speaker? They're teaching quantum physics. <laughs> quantum physics in Waterloo. Uh, but look, this, this is about this government giving their insider developer friends a free ride. Municipal governments keep doing more with less. But at every turn, they're met with nothing but disdain and blame from this Premier. Some municipalities are estimating that by limiting their ability to charge developer fees, this government is bilking them out of tens of millions of dollars over the next five years. Toronto alone is anticipating $2.3 billion in lost revenue. Local governments run the buses people take to work. They maintain our local roads, and they try to build the affordable housing units we so desperately need. When is this government? When Question. is this government going to commit to stop offloading their costs onto municipalities and partner with them to build stronger, more caring communities? 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to reply. No, Speaker, again, uh, to the Leader of the Opposition, what she's really saying is she's against nonprofit housing providers like Habitats for Humanity from getting deferred development charge. Many of the opposition members, when they were on local councils, voted in favour of deferring or eliminating development charges for nonprofit housing and other groups like Habitat for Humanity. So when they were municipal, municipal councillors, they were in favour of this type of policy, but now What's that changed? they're part of the NIMBY party, so they're going to be What's against changed? You know, When it comes to the NDP, their housing policy has no merit. <laughs> the next question. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, let me tell you, this has nothing to do with nonprofits or building affording house, affordable housing. With this comment, with this oh, stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Government side must come to order. I, I have to be able to hear the member who has the floor. Present time, it's the Leader of the Opposition not the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, although he might get his turn. Start the clock. Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, with this government, people out there know it's about who you know and how much you'll pay for it. Back in 2018, one of the first things this government did was take away permanent paid sick days from working people. What a cruel way to start their term, and terrible public policy, too. People should not have to choose between putting their co-workers, customers, and community at risk or losing a day's pay. We have tabled three times now since then the Stay Home If You're Sick Act. It would give people 10 permanent paid sick days, but you vote it down every time. Will this government give workers the time they need to recover and keep people safe by backing the NDP plan for 10 permanent paid sick days? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Mr. Speaker, we were the first province in Canada uh, to bring in uh, paid sick days uh, during the pandemic to uh, support those workers, Mr. Speaker. We were the first uh, province in the country to bring in job protected leave to ensure that when those workers have stayed home, they couldn't be fired from their job. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're working for workers every single day. I'll remind the Leader of the Opposition that she voted against our plan to hire 100 more health and safety inspectors uh, in this province to bring the inspectorate to the highest in provincial history. But, Mr. Speaker, this is an NDP party that has abandoned workers in this province. But under the leadership Order. of Premier Ford, we'll work for our workers every single day. Supplementary question. I'll point out, Speaker, that those measures that the minister talked about are temporary and they end, they end at the end of this month. Right. Speaker, the Conservative members must be hearing the same stories that we are from people in communities all across this province who are exhausted. They feel abandoned by this government. Parents living in constant fear that if they or their kid gets sick, they won't be able to pay their rent or afford the groceries, and the Premier can stay home when he gets yeah. sick. Yeah. Why do these workers deserve anything less? Will this government finally side with working people and make sure everyone has access to 10 permanent paid sick days? To reply, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, do you know what helps workers? I'll tell you what helps workers. When we took office in 2018, the NDP and Liberals ran 300,000 jobs out of this province. As we stand here Order. today, there's 600,000 more people being able to pay rent pay a mortgage, buy a home, get a car, and an electric vehicle car, because we're creating the environment and the conditions for companies to come here and thrive and prosper and grow. And when they thrive, prosper, and grow, Mr. Speaker, the people that work at those companies thrive, prosper, and grow. They put more money into their pockets, more job security. This is an employee's market right now. We're short 380,000 people to fill the jobs. Our GDP is at one trillion dollars now, 18th largest in the entire Response. world, right here in Ontario. That's what helps people. Order. Order. 
Member for Brampton North, come to order. Member for Kitchener Conestoga, come to order. Start the clock. Final supplementary. I tell you that this premier is so out of touch. This room is filled today with nurses, with nurses who are leaving this province at record levels. Nursing has become our greatest export from this province because this government fails to respect working people in this province. Speaker, it took COVID. It took COVID for this government to give even anyone the three paid sick days only for COVID, only for the first time you get COVID, and even that ends at the end of March. Get out there and listen to people in communities across this province. They are struggling. People like parents who can't take time off because they need to put food on the table. It is not a laughing matter. It is not something you should be applauding yourselves for. Government could do something about this. Will you give them the paid sick days that they need? Thank you. Members, please take your seat. Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We love our nurses. We know the dedication. They go in day in and day out. Order. But I'll tell you the numbers, Mr. Order. Speaker. Since 2018, since 2018, there's 60,000 more nurses wow. registered here in Ontario. There's 8,000 more doctors. We set a new record. We set a new record. There was 12,000 alone just last year. We're going to continue hiring nurses. There's 30,000 nurses in our college and universities oh. ready to serve. We're grateful, and we think the world of our nurses, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, if you actually loved and supported nurses, you wouldn't be fighting them in court over Bill 124. My question is to the Premier. In my riding, Windsor Salt Workers, members of Unifor Locals 1959 and 240, have been on strike for weeks now to stop the contracting out of good-paying union jobs. They're fighting an attempt at union busting. The owners of Windsor Salt, Stowe Canyon Industries, have tried to break the picket line and resume production. Will the Premier finally support workers in this province? These workers in particular pass anti-scab legislation and yeah. fight back against the outsourcing of union jobs. Mr. Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, obviously aware of the situation uh, down in Windsor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we uh, always encourage employers, uh, labour workers to sit down and get a deal at the table. We're proud of our uh, labour relations in this province. 99% of deals are done uh, at the table, but Mr. Speaker, we're working every single day to ensure that workers in Ontario have uh, better jobs and bigger paychecks. And I think of the Windsor-Essex uh, region, the amount of young people uh, getting into the skilled trades, joining those unions down in Windsor to build better lives for themselves uh, and their families. But Mr. Speaker, we'll continue uh, every day putting forward worker-friendly policies so they earn bigger job, uh, better jobs and bigger paychecks. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Maybe if the minister actually believed in collective bargaining, the government, as the biggest employer, would not have brought in Bill 124 and Bill 28. <laughs> Speaker, in Leamington, Highbury Canco workers, members of UFCW Local 175, are also on strike, and the company is bussing in scab workers. This government talks about working for workers, but time and time again, they have attacked workers' collective bargaining rights with Bill 124 and Bill, uh, Bill 28. In fact, they supported the Liberals with Bill 115, another unconstitutional bill. Will this government actually work for workers, stand up for collective bargaining rights, and pass anti-scab legislation? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour has the floor. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue working for workers uh, every day in this province. That's why in the June election, Mr. Speaker, we had the endorsement of eight labour unions in this province representing hundreds of thousands of workers. And Mr. Speaker, uh, we believe that government, labour and business have to work together. That's how we're going to improve uh, the lives of people in this province and build stronger communities. That's why I'm proud to say under 
uh, the leadership of Premier Ford. We introduced the Building Opportunities and the Skilled Trades Act. We introduced Working for Workers uh, legislation, Mr. Speaker, Order. that uh, ensured that um, gig workers for the first time in history uh, get minimum wage, that for um, Windsor West, we increase uh, fines to those companies that are breaking the law, that we ensure that there's no lock zone kits in workplaces. But, Mr. Speaker, the opposition NDP voted uh, against these measures in working for workers. So we'll take no lessons the from the party Windsor West that come years order. ago abandoned the working people of this province, and that's why we elect progressive conservatives in Windsor-Essex. Next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you. Uh, and I asked the NDP, I mean, what would workers do under an NDP government? You don't support highways, you don't support jobs, you don't support investment. Stop the clock. I guess I need to point out to the House that you can't ask questions of the official opposition. You, you need to address your question to the government. Start the clock. Sorry, Speaker, I had the wrong notes in front of me. Um, <laughs> My, uh, my question is for the President of the Treasury Board, the Minister responsible for emergency management. Uh, he's a fellow Brampton boy. I expect a straight answer. <laughs> First, uh, I'd like to recognize the dedication and tireless efforts of all those who are, who are involved in Ontario's emergency planning, preparedness and response network. They're heroes. We're all great for, uh, grateful for everything they do in caring for the people of our province. The need for local and provincial declarations of emergencies can arise for a number of reasons. And it's essential that response plans are current and reflect best practices. We know that our government values the safety of all individuals and communities. However, more can be done in safeguarding Ontarians from unanticipated emergencies. Speaker, can the minister please explain what action our government is taking to strengthen its emergency management response operations? To reply, the President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank uh, my colleague and Brampton's finest from Brampton North for that uh, great question and his tireless advocacy on behalf of the people of Brampton and across this province. But he's absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there's nothing more important than the safety and well-being of our families and loved ones. And Ontarians across this province counting on our government to get emergency planning right. That is why. Earlier this month, our government released Ontario's first ever provincial emergency management strategy and action plan. We are the first province in the entire country to put forward a plan. Our new plan establishes a framework for emergency management in Ontario. This sets out a one-window approach to coordinate emergency response across this province. It's response. a proactive planning and monitoring tool to keep Ontarians informed. And we are practiced and prepared emergency response with training and education across this province. We will Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. <clears throat> thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his fantastic response. The importance of ensuring that our province is as prepared as possible for any potential emergency cannot be understated. Sadly, the previous Liberal government, backed by the NDP most of the time, left us with gaps in our emergency response system, leaving our province vulnerable and ill-prepared. Under the leadership of the Premier and this minister, it is reassuring that our government is spearheading a comprehensive emergency management plan for all of Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please provide more details about how our government is approaching the vital work of safeguarding and protecting our province? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. The previous uh, Liberal government left many gaps in emergency management, whether it was freezing hospital budgets, uh, firing nurses, or leaving stockpiles of PPE empty. Mr. Speaker, our government committed to making sure that would never happen again. But, Mr. Speaker, we are also uh, taking a role of collaborating with our emergency management partners across this province. With an increase in wildfires, floods, and other potential emergencies that threaten Ontarians' uh, safeties and communities, it is critical that we have a plan in place to respond to these crises quickly. That is why, as a government, we have worked uh, uh, across this province with partners, including municipalities, First Nations partners, to develop a plan that highlights the actions 
that our government is taking to keep Spons. Ontarians safe and in a constant state of readiness and preparedness across this province. Our commitment to communities across this province is to ensure we are emergency ready. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Good morning, Premier. A private for-profit surgical clinic speaker is operating for the second time this Saturday at the Riverside campus of the Ottawa Hospital from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Meanwhile, there is a long backlog of orthopedic surgeries, over 2,000, to members of the public who are waiting for the public health care they were promised. This is another example of our public operating rooms being closed to the public, who paid for them, but open to the profit of a select few. Question to the Premier. Will this government get public operating rooms fully up and running for everyone? Okay, yeah. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, this uh, question gives me an opportunity to highlight some of the things that our government has been doing to deal with surgical backlogs that I might remind the member existed prior to the pandemic. So we have as a government invested with our hospital partners over $800 million for surgical recovery to deal with exactly that, the surgical backlog that resulted as a, as a result of the pandemic. And I can tell you there are some innovative models that are happening in the province of Ontario that are leading to successes. You know, this is not an either or. This is an expansion. This is an opportunity for people who have been waiting far too long to get those necessary surgeries to happen in community and in a timely manner so that they can go back to work, back in their community, Response? and back with their families. It is a good news story, and we will continue to invest in those innovative models. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, back to the Premier, or perhaps that infomercial we just heard from the Minister. I mean, I'm going to caution the member on his language. That's not helpful. Please um, place your question. Thank you, Speaker. It is, it is a sad day when there are nurses in this building who work very hard for us every single day. We ask serious questions about the attack on the funding of our public hospitals, and we get talking points back. What we know in Ottawa today about this clinic, Speaker, is that nurses are being offered inside our public hospitals Order. twice the salary to work in these for-profit private clinics. Shame. We know that it's going to get harder to keep nurses in our public system as a result of your efforts to hand over these surgeries to for-profit clinics. So a serious question, Speaker. Is this government actually going to invest in our public operating rooms instead of selling them off or renting them out? Minister Health. Speaker, this is a member who is encouraging and actually participating in protests in front of community surgical units. I will take no lessons from a member who doesn't understand that there are people who are waiting for those surgeries who want to have access. James. Clinical surgeries in community have existed Order. in the province of Ontario for decades, and I might also remind the member opposite, approved by Position come to order. governments, by Liberal governments, and yes, by NDP governments, oh, because oh, yeah. they understand side, the value of ensuring that people have access to publicly funded services where and when they need it. Thank you, sir. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Speaker, strong workplace health and safety practice ensure that all workers and employers are safe and protected on the job. In the construction sector, workers deserve access to hygienic washroom facilities. Order. Speaker, the regulations for construction projects under the Occupational Health and Safety Acts are clear. Workers must have access to clear restrooms. Thanks to the leadership of our Premier and this Minister, there are a record number of building projects underway in the community across our province. Speaker, can the Minister please explain what our government is doing to ensure that all workers have access to clean and safe restroom facilities? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. 
Thank you very much. And this is a, a really important question that the member uh, for Don Valley North uh, has asked this morning. Uh, Speaker, the member has hit the nail on the head. Clean bathrooms are essential to respecting the hardworking men and women who are building the homes, schools, hospitals, and transit that our communities and families rely on. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, I hear from workers about the state of uh, bathrooms on some job sites, in factories, and in retail. In 2022 alone, my ministry visited uh, work sites more than 23,000 times to inspect bathrooms and issued nearly 2,000 orders for bathrooms in poor condition. Speaker, my message to workers is clear. Our government has your backs. We stand with you, the workers who are out there building Ontario and all of our communities every single day. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And thank you to the Minister for the response. Speaker, the dignity of workers is of paramount importance to me and my constituents in the riding of Down Valley North. I am pleased to know that ministry inspectors are attending work sites to ensure that washroom facilities meet health and safety standards. We know that the benefits of safe workplace include higher productivity, healthier workplaces, and better recruitment and retention, and fewer fines and work workplace disruptions. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government is supporting the health and safety of workers in Ontario. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member uh, for this really important question. Uh, speaker, let me say this uh, very simply. Everyone has a right to clean and safe bathrooms at work. Workers deserve better. I'm pleased to report that my ministry is currently conducting a workplace bathroom blitz to ensure that those out there building Ontario have access to clean bathrooms. In February of this year, as part of this uh, ongoing blitz that's going to run until uh, March 31st, ministry inspectors issued uh, about 130 orders related to construction worksite washrooms, ensuring the workers who are building our province have access to facilities that they deserve. Speaker, we'll continue working for workers and make sure everyone going to work has a healthy and safe workplace. Thank you. Member for Niagara Falls, come to order. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Seniors and young families are being pressed to the limit as your government has allowed Enbridge to pass along increases in gas prices that are making life very hard for Ontarians. The Ontario Electricity Support Program provides immediate on-bill release for families who struggle to pay their electricity bills. But there is no similar program for families struggling to pay natural gas bills or other heating bills. Speaker, will this government establish such a program in its upcoming budget so every family who struggles to heat their home can get support? Minister of Energy. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My goal as the Minister of Energy is to ensure that we have a reliable and affordable and clean energy system in the province of Ontario. We're doing that, Mr. Speaker. Under the mess that was left us by the previous Liberal government, we have brought electricity prices under control, and we're doing the same thing with natural gas prices, Mr. Speaker. There are programs in place uh, through Enbridge that uh, the member should be passing along to her constituents to be aware of. But it is interesting to get this kind of a question from the NDP. Uh, a party that believes in the highest carbon tax, not just in Canada, but in the world, wow. Mr. Speaker. Oh, world. This party is supportive of the federal carbon tax, which on this Enbridge bill that I have here right now is $50, Mr. Speaker, on a month. Props. Conclude your answer. Hand that prop over, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. For a month now, I've been seeing that prop come across my desk in my office. That doesn't say to Ontarians that are dealing with rising inflation costs to their heating bills, they deserve solutions to That's the right. minister. That's right. Back to the minister. Right. Last week, Niagara had another large ice storm. People have to heat their homes, and there is no way around it. Price to heat your homes are going up and up. People are in desperate trouble. Charles. 
Christensen, a 67-year-old retired manufacturing worker from St. Catharines, showed me his bill, an increase of $100 from six months ago. This is the senior on fixed income making only $1,500 a month. We owe it to our seniors that built our province, yeah. all Ontarians, to have a solution, especially when it's already exists for electricity. Yeah. Speaker to the Premier, does the Premier or anyone else on that side of the aisle believe that it's okay to stand by and do nothing as gas rates double in the middle of the winter and continue Order. to push seniors and young families right to the brink? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I think it's important for the member opposite and all members of the legislature to understand that the commodity price for gas has gone up significantly over the last year, in large part because of the unprovoked invasion by Russia in Ukraine. However, gas prices are coming down, natural gas prices are coming down in Ontario. It, it's pretty rich, though, from the NDP to talk about affordability when it comes to energy prices. This is a party that wants us to get rid of natural gas, Mr. Speaker. It thinks that natural gas is a bad thing when more than 76 percent of homeowners out there are heating their homes with natural gas. This is a party that also supported the previous Liberal government every step of the way in their Green Energy Act, Order. something that was driving up Order. electricity prices by 10 percent, 11 percent year over year. We brought that to an end. It's also Response. a party that doesn't believe in nuclear, Mr. Speaker. Oh. It's a party that believes oh. that the source of energy in our province providing 60 percent of our electricity every day should be phased out. We're not going to take any lessons. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to ask the Minister of Health about her plan to use for-profit clinics to deal with the backlog of surgeries. It seems to me, looking at Bill 60, that a crucial linchpin is the director who checks license applications, does inspections, and revokes licenses for those who break the rules. But whereas in the existing legislation, the director has to be a public servant, an employee of the ministry, under this government's new Bill 60, the director could be anybody or any, quote, entity. It looks like Bill 60 is setting up to have this government delegate oversight of this industry to some unspecified entity. As it happens, the current independent health facilities program is run out of my riding of Kingston and the Islands. My constituents deserve to know how many experienced and qualified staff will lose their jobs to some as yet undisclosed entity. Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. So, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about Bill 60. If I understand the member's question accurately, it is, we as a government are making an investment in community surgical and diagnostic units, and they are concerned that we are going to use fewer people to make those assessments, overviews, and ultimately oversight. Uh, there's a bit of a disconnect there. I am happy that we finally are formalizing a process that uh, patients have asked for for a long time, which is we need timely access to diagnostic and surgery options in community. We have, through Bill 60, a process that will ensure those applications will be assessed and reviewed based on needs, based on backlog, based on waiting lists, and they will be placed in appropriate communities that have those challenges. Response. And we will do that with oversight that ensures, through a licensing process and a renewal process, that oversight is there for the clinics, but most importantly, for the patients. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Mr. Speaker, clearly this government hasn't figured out to whom or to what entity it will delegate the management oversight of the for-profit surgery industry. That's a red flag for me. How do we know that this government isn't going to set things up so that people too close to industry are the ones in charge of licenses and inspections? The, this is a danger in so many industries. There's a term for it, regulatory capture. It's a lot easier to separate the regulator and the industry in the current situation where the regulators are ministry employees. Not anymore with Bill 60. How can the minister ensure that there won't be people going back and forth between the industry and the directorate in charge of licensing and inspecting for-profit surgical clinics? Minister Phelps. 
Thank you, Speaker. You know, the, the member opposite is missing two very important pieces when he talks about the expansion of surgical and diagnostic in community, and that is, of course, that for-profit and hospital partnerships are a critical part of the application process. As we find the innovation that is happening in Ottawa right now, as an example, we can see where, where hospitals working in community with community partners are actually providing a higher and faster level of service. I'm proud of the work that Bill 60 is going to ensure that oversight piece, and I look forward to the members' insights and, uh, and input during committee. Thank you. Mr. Sagamal. Mr. Speaker, as per the Toronto Region of Board of Trade report, gridlock is a fact of life in GTA. And we do not, if we do not address it, it is going to cost us over $15 billion by 2031 in lost productivity. Efficient and convenient transit is essential to support economic and community growth in Ontario. Far too long, people in my riding of Mississauga Malton had not had the public transit they need and deserve. Well, Mr. Speaker, we would not have been in this position if the previous Liberal government had not ignored the transit needs of individuals and families across our province. With 300,000 new Canadians, Ontarians coming to, uh, to Ontario, the situation is going to be even worse. Thankfully, we have a government with an ambitious plan for transportation improvement, and we must continue to make Question. strategic investment. Mr. Speaker, my question to the government is, can you provide the update on the progress of Eglinton Crosstown West Extension, which will better connect Mississauga to Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Government House Leader. I appreciate the question from, uh, from the Honourable uh, Member, Mr. Speaker. Look, under the, uh, the leadership of uh, former Mayor uh, McCallion, we saw uh, really, Mississauga saw such explosive growth, both uh, uh, in terms of people who wanted to live there, economic prosperity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the transit and transportation system in the region did not keep pace uh, with the growth that happened uh, there, and continues to happen because of the hard work of the uh, members of the Progressive Conservative Caucus from Mississauga. Uh, and he is quite right. Uh, the, uh, the previous government certainly let down the people of Mississauga, but I am very happy to report that uh, the Eglinton Cross Crosstown uh, is doing very, very well. And we actually reached a, uh, uh, a landmark uh, just, uh, uh, just last week with uh, half of the tunneling done uh, on the Eglinton, uh, Eglinton West uh, Crosstown extension at uh, Renfrew. Now, look, I, the people of Mississauga have every reason to be Response. very excited by this. I know how hard the, the, uh, uh, the members of the provincial part of the Progressive Conservative Caucus have worked to expand transit and transportation because it is an important part of continuing the economic growth and prosperity for the people of Mississauga. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to say thank you to the Minister for your support for Mississauga. The team Mississauga absolutely appreciates it. It is exciting to learn about the exceptional progress we have achieved. This speaks volume to the strong leadership of Premier and the Minister and Associate Minister of Transportation in delivering on major transit infrastructure in our province. The area around Renfrew Drive and Pearson International Airport is the second largest employment hub in the country. Rapid, reliable, and seamless transit is essential in supporting our workers, as well as reducing gridlock and emissions. Mr. Speaker, the Eglinton Crosstown West Extension will effectively provide connections to other transit options. Residents of Mississauga Malton expect that this project must remain a priority for this government and must be delivered successfully. Speaker, can the government Question. please explain how this transit extension will benefit not only Mississauga Malton but all Ontarians? Thank you, Mr. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member. This is a boring story that is exciting for me, Speaker, because the Eglinton Crosstown West extension is more than halfway dug and it's ahead of schedule by four weeks, Speaker. <laughs> You know, Speaker, this is going to create 31,000 jobs. And it is interesting, though, to hear the NDP heckling this progress. Order. Because I remember when this Premier introduced the largest transit expansion plan in Canadian history in 2018. What did the NDP say? They said it's a back of a napkin plan, it's never going to happen, and they voted down all of those priority subway projects, Order. including. 
the Eglinton West extension, the Young North line, the Shepherd East extension, as well as all of the Go Network expansion. Speaker, this is a party that believes in saying no to transit and getting in the way when this government gets shovels in the ground. This government believes, and we will remain undeterred from the goal of building transit, connecting the grid, and getting it done for commuters in Ontario. Order. The next question, member for Toronto St. Paul. Thank you, Speaker. This Conservative government claims its privatization of health care, Bill 60, will give Ontarians more access to health care they need when they need it. The reality is only those who can afford to pay to play will get the care they need in private clinics and private hospitals. Bill 60 leaves vulnerable patients without deep pockets in dangerous situations where, di where diseases will go undiagnosed and surgeries are being delayed, all while they live in chronic pain and depression as their illnesses get worse. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Why does this Premier believe that access to health care should depend on one's ability to pay? Thank you. I'm going I'm to caution the member on the use of her language. Intemperate language isn't helpful. Order. Minister of Health. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry about that, Speaker. Uh, again, I will say Bill 60 allows us to expand community and diagnostic centers. So the, the member opposite premise to suggest the member for Brampton North will come to order. The member for Waterloo will come to order. Minister of Health has the floor. So the expansion will actually ensure that the wait times that the member opposite is rightly concerned about go down all through a publicly funded health care system that allows you to use your health card not your credit card. Now, we want to see those expansions happening in community because we have seen that they are successful. They, they mean that patients can get back to their families. They mean that patients can get back to their communities and their workforce quickly. We want to eliminate the wait list, and that the member opposite and I can agree, I hope. Supplementary question. Speaker, we fixed health care with better staffing, better care, and better wages. Ask the nurses. They'll tell you today. My question is back to the Premier. Karen Bender is a 73-year-old senior in my community, and she needs eye surgery. She's been told she'll be waiting eight months to a year, and her vision will get worse, if not completely untreatable, the longer she waits. Karen knows of other seniors who are upsold in private clinics, and she's also aware that the Premier and the Minister of Health admitted that their profitization of health care bill has nothing in it to protect patients like her from extra charges. So my question's back to the Premier. What advice would this Conservative Premier give Karen and others without deep pockets waiting desperate for surgery while they've left our publicly funded surgical operating rooms empty and unstaffed in our province? Minister of Health. Thank you. I would say to Karen and the individuals who are waiting for surgery that you can thank Premier Ford and our government for expanding cataract surgeries in Ottawa, in Kitchener-Waterloo and Win Windsor that will immediately ensure that existing capacity that is in community today right now is able to offer more cataract surgeries in the province of Ontario, specifically regarding patients who are concerned that they will be uh, encouraged or forced to use something that they don't want. The publicly funded system has a process in place today. Bill 160 actually expands that so that those individuals who have concerns, who are not able to deal with them in the community, are able to go to the patient ombudsman, something that does not exist prior order. to Bill 60. Opposition come to order. Thank Response. You, The next question. The member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. For, for too many Ontarians, finding the right home is all too challenging. Housing affordability is out of reach for many individuals and families. They're struggling to find attainable homes that meet their needs. In January, the Ontario Real Estate Association reported that the average price of a home was just under $800,000. This price point is out of reach for many Ontarians. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please share what our government is doing to give back the dream of home ownership to my constituents? 
The Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague from Burlington for the question and all the great work that she does yeah. in her riding, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Speaker, our legislation was clear. The More Homes Built Faster Act was intended to build on previous housing bills to further cut red tape and remove unnecessary barriers that were preventing the construction of new units in Ontario. Speaker, one key approach that we're taking is by encouraging density around major transit areas, which will make it easier for Ontarians to take a bus, train or streetcar to and from work and visit family and friends. Speaker, we want Ontarians to have the flexibility when it comes to housing one that they can afford and one that meets their needs and their budgets. And the only way that we can do this, Mr. Speaker, is by increasing supply in the areas that make sense, like major transit corridors, which is exactly what our government is Spots? doing. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Burlington for her strong advocacy when it comes to housing on behalf of our constituency. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for the response. It's positive and encouraging to hear that our government is focusing on policies that promote home construction in major transit station areas. We've also heard from first-time home buyers, workers and seniors who are having a difficult time finding a new and affordable place to live that meets their budget. Our government must find solutions to address the need for more housing so that people at all stages of their lives are able to find a home that is just right for them. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to make housing affordable? The Associate Minister of Housing. And thanks again to my colleague for the great question. Speaker, study after study is telling us that we are in a housing deficit. But we're ensuring that more supply is created of all types, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that home ownership is within reach for more Ontarians. For example, the attainable housing program through the government surplus lands, exploring rent-to-own options and land lease communities. Now, to make housing more affordable and easier to enter the housing market for Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, our government is increasing the term period for homes located in land lease communities from 21 years to 49 years, which, by extending it over time, will make homes more affordable. In fact, Mr. Speaker, our, I saw firsthand the life lease community in the great members riding of Barry Innisfil of Sandy Cove. Speaker, we know more work is Spons. needed and will continue to explore more options to make it easier for first-time home buyers, seniors, young families and future generations to find a place to call home in our property. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker, and my question is to the Premier. Speaker, the government has said that in order for a property to be removed from the Greenbelt, it had to meet certain criteria, including that it, quote, must be on or near readily serviceable land. The Chief Administrative Officer for Durham Region wrote this to the Minister about the changes to the Greenbelt plan and about the lands in Durham slated for removal. Quote, Servicing solutions for these lands have not been developed, no plans have been developed, and downstream infrastructure has not been sized to accommodate extensive development within these areas. Also, the availability of electricity and community services to support this growth has not been contemplated in any other plans to date." End quote. So, why did the government remove the Duffins Rouge Agricultural Preserve and Greenbelt lands in Durham Region despite the fact the lands did not meet the government's own removal criteria. Minister Speaker, it's too easy in Ontario to oppose housing. We know that. Costs are too high. Speaker, there are parents and grandparents that are worried that their children and their grandchildren are going to never afford a home that meets their needs in their budget. The government knows through the Housing Affordability Task Force other reports by CMHC uh, and many others know that we need to get shovels in the ground faster. We posted 15 sites that have the potential of having, as a minimum, 50,000 homes to build upon our More Homes, More Choice plan. Um, the Housing Affordability Task Force gave us a fantastic roadmap. We took it to the people in June, uh, and we're going to implement it. We're going to implement a Spons? housing supply action plan each and every year uh, of a re-elected government under the leadership of Premier Ford, we need to have more housing. We need to provide that opportunity for that young. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
thank you. Back to the Premier. But interestingly, that Ontario Housing Affordability Task Force on page 10 um, said that a shortage of land isn't the cause, that land is available both inside the existing built up areas and on developed land outside the green belts. Yep. But I digress. The province, at its own Greenbelt consultation, assured municipalities that no removal or land exchanges are proposed and the government will not consider the removal of any lands from the Greenbelt. That was just a year ago. Durham CAO wrote, quote, since the expectation was that the Greenbelt was to be protected in perpetuity, servicing solutions for these lands have simply not been developed. End quote. So the land in Durham doesn't meet the government's own criteria, and the government has promised, quote, if these conditions are not met, the government will return these properties to the Green Belt. So, since our lands aren't serviced or near readily serviceable land, when will the minister return the draft lands Question. and Durham Green Belt lands safely to the Green Belt? The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, I'm sorry the member opposite stopped reading the Housing Affordability Task Force at page 10, because if she, she had her read page 11, she'd, or page 12, she'd see recommendation 11, resp support responsible housing growth on undeveloped land, including outside existing municipal boundaries. We're going to continue, Speaker, to work not just with Durham Region, but with all 444 municipalities, many municipal, almost every day. There's a municipality that's passing a resolution supporting our housing pledge. Order. We're building upon the success of the Housing Affordability Task Force. We're making sure that all municipalities have the tools that they need to get shovels in the ground faster, including looking at those six uh, high-growth regions and ensuring that strong mayor powers Response. are set up for those mayors moving forward. We've got a lot of work to do, Speaker, but we're going to be working collaboratively with all 444 municipalities, and under the leadership of Premier Ford, we're going to get it done. Next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Francophone Affairs. Uh, many uh, Francophone organizations have suffered financially during the pandemic. It's essential to have uh, community networks that are solid, where we continue to uh, have the economic uh, revitalization. Yesterday, the government uh, helped the uh, financing program and the exchange between the government of Quebec and the government of Ontario and the Francophonie. Mr. Speaker, the minister can tell us how this agreement between Quebec and Ontario will contribute to the economic development of Ontario Francophonie. Mr. President. Mr. Speaker, I thank my colleague, uh, the member from Windsor Tecumseh, for the excellent question. Our government continues to invest in many initiatives that want to reinforce the dynamism of the Francophone community in Ontario and uh, to ensure its vitality. Uh, during the month of Francophonie, we sent a 2023-24 of the financing funding program and an exchange between the government of Quebec and the government of Ontario regarding francophonie. Following this interprovincial agreement, we'll support joint programs that encourage the development of francophone culture and possibilities of partnerships and the reciprocal cooperation between the two provinces. With this agreement, the government will invest up to $100,000 by each common project. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response, the associate minister. It's fantastic to hear about those initiati initiatives to promote commercial exchanges by promoting francophone language. As a government, we must encourage francophone companies to ensure that they stay prosperous. Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell us what is our government doing through the associate minister to support francophone businesses and companies in Ontario? Response, associate minister. Mr. Speaker, in 2022-2023, Ontario invested 
over $265 million to support collective and joint initiatives to promote francophonie in Ontario and in Canada. Our government recognizes the uh, immense uh, recognition of their participation of francophone businesses and the actions that we've done can be evident of our government as a government. The francophone strategy has several initiatives to help francophone businesses in Ontario, as, such as PAYFO, francophone grants in Ontario, agreement between Ontario and other provinces, and interprovincial agreements through Quebec and Ontario that is at the center of our two governments in order to support francophonie and initiatives. Thank you, Speaker. I would like, as you know, the month of March is Francophonie Month, and I want to wish all the Francophones and Francophiles of this province happy Francophonie Month. My question is to the Premier. Our office has received many negative comments in terms of the content of the program Smart Serve in Ontario. Many skilled people in French has failed the exam that was proposed since the questions were ambiguous, uh, annoying, and no, not well written. This program and its revision requires a renewal of their certificate by the month of June 2023. But more urgently, many people are unable to pass this test. Once again, francophones are not benefiting from this. Can, what can the government do to fix this problem to ensure a fair and equitable access to francophones? Question: We have spoken offline and uh, glad to answer the question publicly. The SmartServe program really is world class, keeps people safe, and we've been upgrading it over over time. It's a it's a product that's been uh, provided to government but not run by government. So, Mr. Speaker, we have engaged with them in terms of servicing. Uh, as you know, some of your colleagues have raised as well. Uh, elderly people who are uh, less able to do the online, so we're working with that. Uh, we're having discussions about the translation, as you've raised before, and we'll continue those discussions. We are aware of the deadline, and thank you for bringing it forward. Supplementary. Thank you for the response, but once this course uh, has been reviewed, will you provide an exemption time for francophone people, and will you remove additional charges that will follow for the ones that have failed more than once, that have failed the exam more than once? Response. We are a very practi practical government. We can requalify, and we want to make sure that we have protection for people uh, who come into contact uh, with. Uh, with those who are, are using the bars and the restaurants and the other services in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I just want to take the moment, the opportunity, to highlight one of the upgrades that we've done through SmartServe, which is with regard to human trafficking, something very important to, to this government, uh, to make sure that those in the front lines are educated in those areas as well. So it's continuous improvement, Mr. Speaker. Thank you for the question. The uh, next question, member for Thunder Bay, Atacoka. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Because of previous, uh, sorry, because of previous fragmented environmental and energy policies, jobs were lost in our manufacturing and automotive sectors, and the promised environmental benefits were not realized. Our government believes that Ontario can be a leader in both environmental stewardship and major manufacturing producer. In order to cement Ontario's role as a leader in the green technology revolution, our government must work with our northern partners and the First Nations communities to secure critical minerals required for future projects. This will ensure that our province is a leader in creating a cleaner, greener future for everyone. Speaker, could the minister please explain how our government is securing Ontario's place as an environmental and manufacturing leader? Thank you. Minister of the Environment, Conservation. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. Um, I appreciate the question from, from the member, and I share his views that action is required now. 
Canada, in fact, is the only jurisdiction in North America with the critical minerals required to support full EVs. And, and Speaker, we're blessed in Ontario with an abundance of natural beauty and, of course, the natural resources we require to support electrification. This Premier, this government, in partnership with municipalities, Indigenous partners, are unlocking that potential. In fact, working with partners in Webway First Nation and Martin Falls First Nation, we're undertaking a first-of-its-kind partnership that will open the corridor to prosperity and ensure the critical minerals we need to decarbonize. Minerals that will fuel Ontario's growing electric vehicle revolution that's supported the $16 billion this Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, in working with the Premier, has attracted to this Response. province. It is truly historic. Speaker, this work will bring good jobs to remote and northern communities in the province of Ontario, ensuring a green jobs for next generation Ontarians for so, so many years. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the response. Our government understands that we need to develop and maintain relationships with key stakeholders in order to generate productive solutions. Our government knows that working together with our partners across Ontario, particularly in the North, is critical for securing a greener, cleaner future. Investments made by our government, along with ensuring that our critical minerals are responsibly and ethically sourced, demonstrates our commitment to economic prosperity and respect for our environment. Speaker, can the minister please provide more information about how these projects will ensure ongoing environmental stewardship while also benefiting Ontarians? Minister of the Environment. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've had the opportunity to visit the, the North and see how important Indigenous-led reclamation projects are working hand-in-hand -hand with industry in the North to offer jobs, to offer incredible opportunity uh, for the North. And building the critical infrastructure and the links that we need to unlock that potential is a priority of this government. With more electric vehicles on the road, Ontario will continue to be a leader in Canada in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Speaker, we're doing it by working with industry industry with workers, a concept that unfortunately previous governments really failed to capitalize. For a young worker in the steel sector, like my grandfather who came here from Italy with no money in his pockets, who worked in the open hearth blast furnace, they now know that green jobs of the future are going to happen at DeFasco and Algoma as we electrify the arc furnace to secure green jobs for generations to come. But we're not stopping there. We're building the public transit we need. You know, the U with the line crossed through it, the only major jurisdiction that had it. We're building public transit and the subways. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. Government House Leader, I understand, wants to inform the House of the business for next week. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, rising, of course, standing order 59. Uh, just to uh, uh, again thank all uh, colleagues for their uh, their uh, very effective work uh, for the people of the province of Ontario over the last uh, last week. Uh, and while I have the floor, just to uh, wish the, again the Minister of Finance a very happy birthday. Um, so Monday, March the 6th, Mr. Speaker, in the afternoon, uh, we will have Opposition Day uh, Motion Number 2 and Bill 46, uh, Less Red Tape, Stronger Ontario Act. On Tuesday, March the 7th, in the morning, uh, we will be debating a bill which will be uh, introduced. Uh, later today, and we will continue that debate on uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, in the evening, uh, we will have private members motion number 27, standing in the name of the member for University Rosedale. On Wednesday, March the 8th, uh, in the morning, we will continue debate on a bill which will be introduced later today. Uh, during the afternoon routine, the minister, uh, Minister Fullerton, will give a ministerial statement on International Women's Day. Uh, in the afternoon, we will continue debate on a bill which, uh, again, will be introduced later today. Uh, in the evening, we will have private members uh, uh, Bill 62, uh, standing in the name of the member for Haldeman Norfolk. And on Thursday, March the 9th, in the morning, we will continue debate on the bill. Morning and afternoon, uh, colleagues, we will continue on the bill introduced later today. And in the evening, uh, we will debate uh, Bill 65, standing in the name of the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. There being no further business, oh, point of order. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome my good friend, Mansoor Mirza, 
a community advocate who's been giving free uh, mathematic uh, online classes to students throughout the pandemic. Uh, also, uh, his friends Jafar Ahmed, Alison Latour, uh, Zamal Ahmed, who are relative uh, to the page, uh, legislative page, White Sharp. Welcome to Queen's Park. Peterborough Court has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to wish a happy 50th birthday to my constituent assistant, Andrea, back in Peterborough. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.